Okay. Okay, super. Uh, so we start with the second talk, um, and it's uh, David Lin, who came here all the way from far Taiwan. away, Taiwan. Yes. Uh, so thanks for making this. And um, he's going to be telling us about phase structure of one plus one dimensional Turing model from MPSs. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this first ever Tensor Network workshop that uh, I attend. And uh, I'm going to present uh, uh, some work I've been doing with uh, uh, my collaborators here, including uh, Mary Carmen and uh, Christoph, who are sitting in the audience, and uh, also, in particular, with uh, a student who actually did all the foundational work for this project. Um, so what I'm going to present today is uh, based on uh, largely our contribution to the Lattice Conference, the uh, Lattice Field Theory Conference last year, and also we have an article in, prepar uh, in preparation, and hopefully it will appear pretty soon. Um, how about turn the page like this? Okay, so in this work, I will uh, briefly uh, give you uh, the motivation of uh, uh, why we, at least I, as a lattice field theorist, will be motivated uh, to uh, jump into this field of uh, uh, tensor networks. And also, I will just uh, briefly uh, give you, uh, or remind you, what the theory model is all about and why it's interesting uh, to study. And then I will give you the lattice formulation that we're using and also how to write it as a matrix product state. And thanks for uh, the uh, previous speaker that I don't have to say too much about the MPS anymore. So I'll just you know, be very quick here about uh, MPS. And then I'll present you with the numerical results uh, from our study of the phase structure of the uh, two-dimensional theory model. And then I'll conclude and tell you uh, uh, that uh, there are many more things to be done uh, about this model in this approach. And that's what we're doing in the near future. Okay, so let's start from the motivation. Uh, just to very quickly remind you, and this is what I learned from uh, friends such as uh, uh, Mary Carmen and Christoph, that uh, what we are doing is, uh, um, you know, we abandon this uh, uh, strategy of d doing uh, the path integral uh, in lattice gauge field theory, lattice gauge theory calculations, and we just deal with the Hamiltonian operator. So we have to work out the operator formalism for quantum field theory, and then we then write it as uh, a quantum spin model. And uh, then we use uh, techniques such as MPS or uh, the DMRG to get the ground state. And once we're done with the ground state, we can actually use it to compute all the correlators and, you know, and we can get a spectrum and so on. So that's the general strategy that we're following. And I think the audience knows this very well. Okay, so the motivation for us to follow this uh, strategy is um, uh, that, uh, of course, is something new to lattice field theorists. And um, you know, doing something new is always very, very interesting and exciting. And also, uh, by dealing with the Hamiltonian formalism and dealing, especially dealing with the uh, the operators, we don't have to face the uh, side problem. At, at least that's our naive expectation. And and also, uh, we could actually use this uh, Hamiltonian formalism to try to obtain some information about uh, real-time dynamics and quantum field theories. And that's something the uh, path integral formalism cannot or you know very cannot give you or it's very difficult to obtain using the uh, path, path integral formalism and also this uh, kind of formalism we're seeing the same tune as quantum computations for future quantum field theory calculations so in this talk i will present you uh, our work on pinning down this uh, uh costless to list phase transition in this model that we're studying so the third model Okay, theory model one, 101. So we all know, uh, many of us at least, uh, high energy physicists know that uh, the uh, uh, one plus one theory model is uh, dual to the sine Gordon theory as established by Sidney Coleman. And this is the theory model action where we have this uh, bare, bare mass and the uh, bare, fo uh, bare four fermion coupling here. And it's dual to this uh, sine Gordon theory uh, in this uh, uh, S duality. 
meaning this uh, coupling constant G is, inverse, is inversely due to this coupling kappa in the sine codon theory. Okay? And in the textbook, you can also see that, uh, uh, that this sine codon theory is written uh, in this form, where you just uh, uh, rescale uh, the few variables. So this is just some dimensionless uh, parameter T, which actually sets the uh, standard size of the fluctuations you have in your theory. And uh, in, in particular, if you read Coleman's paper very carefully, he actually said that uh, uh, this kind of duality will actually work in the uh, zero charge sector, which means uh, the total uh, fermion charge will have to be zero. And also, in the dual, in, in the dual theory, uh, the total uh, topological charge will have to be zero. So a little bit more about this duality. As I said, it's, uh, uh, you have this uh, strong weak inverse, dual, uh, uh, inverse duality here. So the Fourier model uh, coupling G is inversely dual to the sine codon uh, theory uh, coupling T. And it's also uh, pretty well known that uh, this theory can, uh, is actually also dual to the uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, classical XY model. And you can think of this as the following. Uh, you can think of this uh, XY model vortex anti-vortex pairs as actually uh, connected through a string or through strings of uh, the king solutions. Okay, if you, uh, if, you, if you just sit down and work through the geometric uh, definitions of these topological objects in these theories. So, so what was actually established in the literature was that uh, this uh, coupling uh, T is inversely dual to the uh, uh, temperature in units of the coupling constant uh, between the ne nearest neighboring spins in the XY model, which I denote as K here in this talk. Okay? So, just to finish what I want to say about the duality here, uh, here I also list the, uh, uh, the operators which will be dual to each other. The uh, fermion current in the uh, vector current in the Fourier model uh, is dual to the uh, topological current in the sine codon theory, and the uh, psi bar psi uh, operator is uh, also dual to this cosine operator in the uh, in the sine codon theory. Okay, so if I scroll back one page, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this uh, mass term m is the only uh, dimension for a coupling in the theory model, and it's also giving the, uh, the mass term here in the sine codon theory. So that makes perfect sense. And it also in, in Coleman's uh, original paper, he mentioned that uh, uh, if you keep decreasing this theory model for fermion coupling G uh, to go below uh, minus pi over two, the vacuum actually becomes uh, unstable. Okay, and then he claimed that uh, uh, beyond that point, uh, this whole thing may actually not make sense at all. But these days we know that uh, this actually marks the uh, phase transition in these theories, which I will uh, briefly remind you on this uh, next slide. So if you look at the uh, theory model uh, renormalization group flows um, as obtained in the expansion of the mass parameter in the theory, uh, these would actually be the uh, beta functions of the four fermion coupling G, and also the mass itself, where lambda is just a cutoff scale that you introduce in your calculation. It's also very well known that the massless theory model is a two-dimensional conformal field theory, which can be easily solved analytically. Okay, and then if you look at these uh, uh, beta functions, it actually they actually reflect this kind of uh, fact as well. That if you set the mass to be zero, of course the uh, uh, the four fermion coupling G is not running at all. Okay, and what's even more interesting is if you look at this uh, renormalization group equation governing the flow of the uh, of the uh, of the um, the mass operator, you see that uh, the point where G equals minus uh, pi over two actually plays a very important role. Okay, so let's assume that if this you know, is valid up to some uh, mass m, and you're gonna have this line here. Okay, so this is the m direction, and this is the g directions. Here I'm actually plotting this in terms of renormalized couplings. And then on this side, the, uh, 
The mass term in the uh, theory model is actually irrelevant if you look at the structure of this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, renormalization this uh, this beta function here, okay, and on the other side, the uh, mass parameter becomes uh, relevant. So the RG flow will take you away from massless limit, and this side it goes the other way around. Okay, so in other words, uh, uh, from this side you would uh, expect that at low energy your theory should actually look like a massless theory, which is conformal, which is a conformal field theory. And if you actually go and do the calculation in the um, in say the cyclotron theory, uh, the um, the Cosine term in the cyclotron theory actually is also irrelevant on this side if we use the duality uh, relation to work out uh, what this uh, uh, g corresponds to in the uh, in, in the parameter alpha in the cyclotron theory. And of course, on the other side, this cosine term becomes uh, relevant. So you can imagine that this side, the cyclotron theory, would become a free bosonic theory in two dimension at low energy, and. And then, if you think of this whole thing in terms of the XY model, uh, on this side, it's actually uh, can be well approximated by this spin wave description, and on the other side is a Coulomb gas. Okay, so this is the kind of phase structure that uh, we want to set out uh, to probe using the uh, MPS uh, method. Okay, so then let's start with the lattice formulations for the uh, for this problem. So um, the first uh, difficulty or challenge uh, I faced when I first came to this, uh, this uh, uh, field is uh, that we have to uh, actually work with the uh, operators. And for this, uh, for this um, particular theory, there's some subtlety. Um, so, so naively, I would expect that it's very easy to work out Hamiltonian. You just take the Lagrangian from the action I just gave you, and you just do the uh, uh, Legendre transform, and you get your Hamiltonian. It turns out to be incorrect, okay, because uh, because of the anomaly. So uh, the anomaly actually plays a very essential role uh, in the uh, in the bosonization procedure for this theory. And you also know that in two dimension, the vector and axial uh, uh, currents are actually the same thing. Okay, there's no way to distinguish them. So Although the four fermion couplings you write down in the original theory uh, are actually the products of two vector currents, they will have to be aff affected by the anomaly. Okay, so it was actually uh, this whole thing was actually worked out um, by Carl Hagen uh, many years ago in a very very uh, nice paper that he actually looked at the operators and uh, for the energy momentum tensor and worked out the. Uh, uh, the, all the commutators that they have to um, satisfy, and then this is the result you got. Okay, so this should be the Hamiltonian operator that you work with, okay? but not the uh, not the uh, Hamiltonian that you can naively obtain by doing the Legendre transform from your uh, Lagrangian. And then once you get this, you can just do the uh, uh, you can. Well, you have to put it on a lattice, and then we use uh, the stagger fermion uh, formulation to do this. And this is very nice because we're actually dealing with a one plus one dimensional uh, field theory, and we don't discretize time. So uh, all we have to do with is the spatial direction. And therefore, being a, two, uh, being a one dimensional problem with a two component spinner, the uh, staggering uh, procedure will completely solve the, the, uh, the fermion doubling problem. In other words, in our work, there's no fermion double at all. Okay, so this is very nice. And then once you get the uh, uh, stack of fermion formulation for this Hamiltonian, what you do is that you follow this standard way of doing the uh, jordan wigner transformation by writing the whole thing in terms of these uh, uh, spin matrices. Okay, and this is what you get. And also, uh, we found in the literature of condensed matter physics, and also by Martin Lucia in the 70s as well, that uh, they actually st uh, use a slightly more uh, complicated way of obtaining this uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, this is the XSZ spin model Hamiltonian with the, uh, with the uh, staggered field, external field, and also with the constant staggered, f uh, with the constant external field here, that uh, people obtained this uh, uh, back in the 70s um, with a different te uh, technique, and by taking into account the uh, 
the lattice effects, the lattice artifacts, and this is going to be the thing we use. But uh, eventually what's happening is that uh, this delta that I will present you actually uh, incorporates uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, non-trivial structure of the Hamiltonian here. And then M, of course, is just the, uh, the master. And I will also uh, notify you that uh, this, uh, the uh, the, now we're trying to actually study the, uh, um, uh, the behavior of this, uh, uh, this uh, non-trivial topology in the field theory so that's, uh, that actually restricts us in the uh, zero total charge sector. And uh, by working out what that corresponds to in this uh, spin model, uh, using the Jordan Wigner transformation as well, we realize that it's, just, it's actually just the uh, total uh, spin z components. So uh, we put in this penalty term by setting this lambda as big as the cutoff scale, uh, as uh, you know, just to pick up the spin zero by setting this target s to be zero. Then you pick up only the spin zero uh, uh, contributions when you choose uh, when, when you use the variational techniques to minimize uh, for the energy to get your ground state. Okay, so this was already covered by uh, the previous speaker, so I would just uh, largely skip what we're doing. So this is just a standard uh, uh, DMRG procedure encoded in the uh, uh, MPS formulation, and we're using open boundary condition. And then we started from some random tensors in, um, uh, in a small, uh, in a very small uh, bond dimension, D equals 50, and then we, and then and then once we obtain the ground state, we just uh, use these ground states to increase the, uh, the, um, the bond dimension one by one, and, uh, and we go up in bond dimension that way in our work. Okay, so just to show you that uh, uh, what we have as our, as our uh, uh, matrix product operator for the Hamiltonian, so this is the building block, it just, you just multiply all this together, and at the boundary, you either take the row or the or the column, okay? So I have to implement the, uh, the open boundary condition. And these are just some definition of the uh, parameters which appear in these uh, um, matrix product operators. So since we are, since we are actually uh, studying the uh, phase structure of the theory, uh, we'll have to do a scan, okay, in the, uh, in the couplings. So what we do is that we use about uh, 20 values of the coupling G or delta, okay, which is the function of G, as I introduced earlier on in this range. And then we, originally we chose to run at uh, uh, four uh, bare masses. Uh, so these are the bare masses in lattice units. And then we realized that it was not enough. So we, we had to go a bit uh, smaller in the uh, in the fermion mass, so we perform this run too in our work, okay. And also these are the bound dimensions, bound dimensions that we use, and we also uh, use uh, the system sizes and perform uh, and thermodynamic limit uh, extrapolation as well, okay. So in the results I present you, I'm presenting you now. Uh, uh, we are actually doing this bond dimension to uh, infinity extrapolation first, and then we extrapolate to the uh, system size equals infinity afterwards. Okay, so before I give you uh, the results for the uh, probe of the phase structure, uh, let me show you uh, the uh, convergence of our DMRG search for the, uh, uh, for the ground state. So this is the energy per site, okay, that you can compute, and this is a particular choice of the, uh, of the couplings G, and the mass M, okay? And you can see that for this cho choice, it goes down like that. And here, uh, you can see that uh, we have to go uh, more sweeps in order for the, for the energy to, come, uh, to converge. And this, uh, this actually is indicating that there may be two distinct phases in the theory, okay? Just by this uh, um, algorithmic performance here, okay? So now, let me show you the uh, things that we actually compute. So the first thing uh, that we look at is the uh, entanglement entropy, okay? So what's this? So this is an example, say, uh, for the system, with the system size equals 1,000. And so we just uh, partition the uh, 
divide or divide the, uh, the system into two parts. Like we move from site one, and then there will be one and 999, and so on. And then we move, move across the lattice, and we compute the entanglement entropy this way. And then, so according to the celebrated work of uh, Calabrese and Cardi, that uh, this uh, entanglement entropy should actually exhibit this kind of scaling behavior, where this k is just the, uh, it's just a, uh, an unknown parameter, but c is the central charge of the theory. And this scaling behavior is only valid when the system is uh, at criticality. Okay? So if the system is not critical, this scaling should not show at all. Okay? And this n is just side n, and n, capital N is the total number of sides, which is 1,000 in these plots. So first of all, you see that uh, uh, you see that uh, you need large enough bone dimension for, uh, for this to work, okay? So these plots are actually uh, where this uh, scaling behavior is manifest, okay? But then you have to go up to, say, bone dimension equals about 400 for this to work. And there are cases where uh, this uh, scaling behavior is not there at all, okay? So on the previous slide, these are the, the master's limit. So the theory should be conformal, okay? So this kind of uh, scaling behavior for criticality should show up, and, as, and indeed it does. And here you see that uh, for massive cases where I present you uh, m equals 0.2, you see it depends on where, uh, uh, it depends on the value of your four fermion coupling, the scaling behavior might or might not show up, okay? And in particular, if you take uh, where the scaling behavior is valid, and then you just uh, uh, plot this against the log here, and you see that the slope is actually one when the bond dimension is large enough. This is, act this is actually applicable to all the cases we look at where the scaling is valid. In other words, the central charge is always one. Okay, so we're finding a critical phase where uh, the theory is actually a free bosonic theory. Now, the next one uh, we look at is the uh, soliton op uh, correlator. Um, well, well, it's actually something very simple in the fermionic theory. It's just this uh, fermion correlator, which uh, computes, computes it with the external states being the, uh, the ground states or the vacuum. And uh, Mandelstein showed that uh, this is actually, uh, in, the, in, in, the bos in the bosonic theory, it's just a soliton operator convoluted with some vertex operators, okay? So what really, since I'm running out of time, what really is here is that uh, these uh, soliton operators, they should actually give you uh, the parallel decay against uh, the distance r in the critical phase, and uh, you should have an exponential decay in the gapped phase, okay? And if you do the uh, jordan victor transformation, you can write it as the spin uh, variables, and you can see that this is clearly topological because this is spin variable on the xy plane. This is another one on the xy plane with distance between m and n, and then you keep rotating it about the z direction. So it's a bit like you're counting how many times you, you do the rotation when you move around this, uh, this one-dimensional uh, string. Okay? So the result is here that uh, you see that uh, at uh, m equals zero, large enough bone, bone dimension, uh, whatever, I'm, I'm showing you many uh, cup values of the coupling here, that uh, you always see a parallel. This is the lock to lock. So uh, these straight lines just show that uh, you see parallel behavior. And also the exponent depends on the, the, uh, the coupling, which means uh, this is a signature of the uh, coastal phase transition. And here, on the other hand, you see that uh, when you deal with the massive uh, theory, uh, uh, as some cases, for some cases, this, this parallel is not there, okay? And then the next thing uh, I will show you is the uh, chiral condensate. Um, so these are from our round one, this chiral condensate computed uh, against the uh, coupling as several masses, okay? So this is how you will transform your uh, chiral condensate into this spin variable. But the message to take home is, this is going to be my last slide, okay? <laughs> is that uh, um, at the coupling 
at, at, at the values of the coupling constant where, where you see distinct scaling behavior, if you, if you just change the, uh, the mass parameter and try to uh, trace how this uh, uh, condensate would behave, would behave uh, down to the massless limit, you see that uh, the chiral condensate always vanishes in the massless limit. So you don't have any long range uh, um, order, uh, local, you don't have any local order parameter in this phase transition at all. This is what we're finding. Okay, so this is just uh, to show you that so this is what we found. Recap very quickly that uh, uh, the uh, mass parameter, when mass is not zero, we seem to be finding a conformal phase down here and a gap phase down here. And then when mass, uh, for the massless case, uh, the theory is always uh, uh, conformal. And, uh, and, and the central charge is always uh, equal to one on the, uh, the, the red region. So with that, I will conclude that, uh, uh, um, that uh, by using this uh, uh, MPS technique, that uh, uh, some, of, uh, some of us can actually uh, try to do a lattice calculation to see this BKD phase transition uh, in a theory model, which is actually quite cool, I think. Um, and then currently, uh, we are actually doing a little bit more work to uh, actually have more uh, confidence that uh, this is indeed what we are observing. And on top of that, uh, what's even more interesting is uh, uh, we've been implementing uh, the calculation of real-time evolution uh, with a quench. Okay? So this can actually probably tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, uh, what, what the dynamics is uh, when the vacuum actually changes the topological properties. And also, we're interested in computing the spectrum of the theory, and that's for the future. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went a bit over time. Okay, we're doing okay with time, so uh, there is space for one or two questions. I think I see two questions, so it's perfect. Uh, when you switched on the mass in, in the transparency, where you show, showed that you had departure from power law behavior, there was a curve where, nevertheless, you do seem to show have power law behavior. Is that is it possible oh, yeah, to understand yeah. why? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, when you know it's massive. Yeah, when it's massive, right? But uh, as I said, um, what we're finding is that uh, for the massive case, for the massive case, mm -hmm. the th the theory may actually be conformal as well. So this is the phase structure that we obtain from this work. Oh, so oh, you're, you're so it's right. this. So so it's actually this regime that we're probing there. Oh. Yes, and this is consistent with the scaling behavior of the uh, entanglement entropy. Yeah. Um, can you just summarize again where you exploited the duality to the Singh Gordon model in your calculation? Sorry, say again. Can you summarize again where you exploited what the duality to the singe gordon model in your calculation? I mean, did you just mention this as a fact, or is it actually entering this analysis? Ah, okay, to? very good. So, so this is just... Uh, okay, so let's, maybe this is the, uh, the point. So, um, so, so we actually explored this uh, duality strictly in the zero charge sector. That's, that, we always, that we always do, okay? Um, but as I said, what was actually not clear, um, at least in Coleman's original paper, when we tried to understand it, was uh, he, he never mentioned this, uh, this phase transition. So what we seem to be finding is that, uh, um, what we seem to be finding is that uh, by using these spin model techniques, we establish this phase structure in the um, in a theory model, which actually looks like this. And if you look at this uh, RG flows, it actually resembles a bit of these uh, costless equations. Okay, so it's, it seems to me that uh, this duality can be established everywhere. In other words, uh, wherever you expect a phase transition in the scalar theory. And indeed, I mean, if you, if you look at the RG equations for the, uh, for the scalar theory, 
I mean, there's a phase where this cosine term in the, in the sine column theory will become irrelevant. Okay? And there you should expect uh, some low energy effective theory, which is free bosonic theory. And that's what we're finding as well using uh, the spin model representation of the uh, theory model. Yes. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.